Which, where do you, you want to start somewhere? Or? Uh, well, first, just um, introduce yourself mm -hmm. as the author. What has led you to this time okay. and what you're doing, and then we'll take off with the questions later. Sure. <clears throat> Yeah, you know, I've been having sex with I was four. They they talk about the impact on a child, and it's and that's true. It 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 does it, but it's um it's not the impact that is necessarily felt as a child because you're incredibly resilient. It's when you wake up thirty years later and you realise what was done to you and that your life is in total disarray because of it. And it all tracks back to a series of events and things that were done to you, not by you. It's not the breaking of the life as young because it is, it's having to deal with the consequences of it in adulthood. I grew up in Thailand, so I'd seen sexual exploitation and all these things going up. Second largest criminal enterprise in the world. It takes a lot to get uh, shock me, we'll say it that way. And to see it rampant, it literally just makes you it revolt it. I think she got aroused watching him beat me and uh, he got aroused and you know, watching her engage me sexually. Me empezaron a prostituir desde los 12 años a los 16 años de edad. Me pegaban desde muy chica, abusaban de mí desde los 5 años. And, and I think that is the, the real legacy of, um, of child sexual abuse and the, the horrendous thing, which is sexual trafficking. What's cool about this film is that we actually really had no idea what we're doing. <laughs> we were just moved by a vision. We were just moved by the movement. We were just moved by, you know, the idea that we can possibly make a difference and an impact and raise awareness and inspire the youth to take action. You know, this is a nonprofit film. I'm a monk. And so there's no personal gain for me or for our center. The gain is impact, reach, awareness. People can possibly change. And so during the research phase, uh, searching for people to interview, you know, it was a scary process. Well, at least for me, I think the others were, were good with, you know, sending an email. But, you know, for me to approach these organizations and high level people and, you know, nonprofits like UNICEF, it's kind of intimidating. You know, I introduced myself like, hey, I'm a nun, I'm a U.S. veteran, and I'm directing this film to help raise awareness on sex trafficking by inspiring the youth movement. And all of them were just like, yes, it's all about the youth, let's do this. We really went into this project with no expectations. All we wanted to understand was what sex trafficking was and how we can be of help by raising awareness of this issue. So we were inspired to travel to the Philippines, Mexico, and New Orleans, and even you know locally Dallas to meet the heroes of the movement. But it turns out, you know, what we were initially looking for was completely different. You know, we just wanted to know what sex trafficking was and we thought it was pretty straightforward. But really, it turned out to be something completely different and we had a bunch of misconceptions. A lot of us, we think that ended 200 years ago with the Emancipation Proclamation and absolutely did not. A recent work by Joseph Miller called The Problem of Slavery as History encouraged historians and others to talk less about slavery 
and more about slaving. When we use the word slavery, we're conjuring an institution, an institution that most people will associate with chattel slavery, with the transatlantic slave trade, uh, these kinds of things. And that institution did, in fact, die in the United States. Um, but if we look at slaving, that is the ways of maintaining unfreedom, commodifying the body, uh, all of the practices that really make up the constitutive experience of what it means to be enslaved, then slaving certainly doesn't stop. It maintains, it morphs, and it continues. Look, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a tough sell to a lot of people because, you know, it's a subject matter that a lot of people don't want to deal with. It's just kind of uncomfortable. I think the missing piece for me was the scale of, of this crime, you know, where it's 20, 30 million people a year. I've been working in this field for almost 25 years already. Because um, the victim really younger and younger. The youngest victim that we cater in this shelter is a one-year-old girl who actually sold to sex, cyber sex. Down in a lot of South American countries, I've been involved with some guys that do uh, do rescues from, from for sex traffickers. And one of the guys goes down there, he's involved in a great organization, a couple of them I know, and they go down there and they, they act as people coming down to buy girls. America and real estate moguls coming down to buy girls and they set up the deal, they get a big suite in a hotel and they do deals with the local cartels. And it's simply a spreadsheet. Uh, the, the guy brings in a spreadsheet. Um, he says, well, what age girl do you want to buy? Well, if you want to buy a 12 year old girl, it's going to be $20,000 because that's how much money she'll make me. If you want to buy a a six year, 16 year old girl, and I've had her for four years, well, you can get her for three or four grand. And they've got the whole thing worked out. It's a, it's a business. And um, it's a business based on prostitution that's really enabled by tourism. And I've got some great friends involved in recovery on that end. And that's, they do a fantastic job. But those guys will tell you, because of the level of depravity they see, for every 10 girls they rescue, they're leaving hundreds, if not thousands, behind. That next week, another American tourist, male or female, is going to be down there demanding to buy children for sex. Parents try to find different ways of survival, but also finding ways out. For their children, um, I think many, unfortunately, many parents do sell their children cold-heartedly, but many parents are also fooled into believing that these children are moving on to a better future, if you like. Very few children here, it seems, are actually kidnapped, you know, taken off the street and then sent uh, for traffic. They are actually handed over by their parents one way or another. But, you know, these are small kids being told to carry out sexual acts uh, with, well, with themselves or with another child. These boys, a lot of them were from upcountry Thailand, where they didn't even speak mainstream Thai. They spoke different dialects, or they'd come from Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Malaysia, different countries, and they'd just be taken, you know? Uh, the traffickers, they'd go to their hometowns and they'd tell the parents, listen, you can't afford to feed your kids. We can give your kid a job in Bangkok. He'll work in a restaurant, he'll wash dishes, he'll make, you know, maybe 5,000 baht a month. 
will send some of that money back to you. And these parents, you know, they don't have a choice. They can't feed their kids. So they send them, and then of course, these kids, they don't work in restaurants. They're either sexually exploited as male prostitutes for gay men in Thailand, or they're put on the streets as beggars, or they're even made to steal. So those are the sort of situations that these boys are coming out of. And they're so young, some as young as four years old. Four to 16 was the ages at this school. People know that they can get people vulnerable, so they uh, kidnap them, literally. And they took them by force to work in fields or in sexual exploitation. If this is all you experience day to day, then you don't know of anything else. Um, if you're expecting to be treated a certain way, if you're expecting the only form of affection to come through sexual contact, that if you want to be touched at all, um, then you behave in a certain way and you, you receive that human touch through sexuality, then that's what you go looking for to a foot, because we all need touch. I, I think if you're brought up in an environment and you don't know it's different, then you don't know that there's something else out there that's different. So you don't actually see yourself as a victim of trafficking unless it's happened later in life. If it's happened early then, or abuse is early, then that's all you ever know. So there's no reason to cry out. I know that sounds odd, but if you're 16 and you've been having sex since you were four, then those 12 years are the only memories that you have. They, they would never know that, that, that there was a life outside that. You know, the most hurt, hurtful, most traumatic experience a child could have of both physical and sexual abuse happens in the home by their own parents. In an article I just read by a woman that was engaged by, um, I think it was the FBI, that they're involved in the investigation of child pornography in America. Um, she was encouraged by a friend to turn the volume down on the videos when she watched it, and she decided not to. So she would turn the volume up, and she said the haunting thing that was for her is that not one of these children made a sound. One case, there was a man, a, a father, a stepfather, videoing having sex with his daughter, five or six-year-old daughter, videoing on a handicap while he's penetrating her. And this little girl, her eyes glazed over, and she looked away and didn't make a sound. The, and, and the woman said that that was the most horrendous part of the entire thing. Somehow they felt it was okay to engage with a sexual act with a, with a child. So I wonder what they had done to get to that point. How can you... One of the things that we know is that most women who end up trafficked were severely abused, either sexually or physically, when they were children. We now know that early trauma affects the brain. And we also know that if your brain is suffering from trauma, you will become a vulnerable teenager. And that is when young women are recruited into sex trafficking. Once uh, young women have, quote unquote, hooked up with a trafficker or a pimp, then very often force is used and coercion is used. Uh, and that is what makes it into sex trafficking. So you might be lured into the arms of someone, of, of a potential boyfriend who turns out to be a pimp by the promise of, oh, we're gonna be staying in hotels, we're gonna be, you know, we're gonna go to discos, we're gonna, we're gonna do drugs, you're gonna have great clothes. And that then very quickly becomes something quite different. There is a mis, a, uh, a consensus that something like this, sex slavery, sex trafficking, uh, 
is is only happening in third world countries where you know people maybe don't necessarily care they turn a blind eye which is completely untrue there uh, are cities across the US where it is a daily basis issue Living in Los Angeles, it is one of the main hubs. You know, a lot of towns along the border of Mexico, it's very easy to get girls and put them right into Mexico and then move them wherever they need to go. Um, it's it's a very lucrative business for those um, that that take children and take women and take men. The it's a thirty-two billion dollar a year business, and the average cost for uh, a slave is ninety dollars. So there's quite a, <laughs> a, a uneven balance there monetarily, and um, you know it. The U.S. is one is one of the top countries where where these slaves come from. I find this all the time, right? That people say this is a problem outside of Houston. This is a problem outside of Texas, outside of the United States. This is a much bigger problem than what you might imagine it to be. It's not just something that happens in other places, that indeed it's happening here. And I think there are many who would say demand because of our affluence is greater in the United States than in almost any other place. You know, people want to make money with this industry. And the place where there's a lot of money is here in the United States. And so uh, whether they're domestic girls or international girls, trafficking is here with us here in the United States. I was getting stares from a bunch of people while walking in the red light district. Like I'm wearing white, so it's definitely like I wasn't going undercover or anything. And so, you know, for them to look and be cautious, and then, you know, in my mind, I'm just trying to say some mantras, or trying to say some like really good sounds and send out some prayers to, you know, to for the girls that if by chance their soul would hear, hear me, like, hey, stay strong, like fight, escape, do whatever it is you need to do to get out. You know, people are ready to help you. You know, and all I could do was send those thoughts as I'm walking down the strip. There's girls selling their body and then there's me a monk. <laughs> It, it, it was um, definitely an interesting experience because, you know, they're curious, like, what are you doing there?
unless we're prepared to look at the darkness within our own soul and then have a look of the condition in our world that caused it, then we're never going to be able to progress and grow. A lot of this is just uh, ignorance, I think. People just don't know, and they don't want to know. I think that's, that's what is at the root of a lot of these problems, that people haven't, don't have enough compassion for other human beings. And I think that's what has to be changed. Because if you really knew that girl, if you really care, if somebody knew what she went through and everything, I'm sure they, there's no way this guy would want to pay and have sex with her, right? I don't think so. You know, he probably wanted to take her out of there and beat, beat the hell out of those guys, you know. In order for us to address the issue of sexual trafficking, um, it's not just a matter of rescuing girls that have been kidnapped or boys that have been kidnapped. At some point, you have to ask the question, what has happened to us that we actually crave and desire that? What, what, what happens to us as men and women that that's what satisfies us and makes us feel complete in a very intimate way? Um, and I think only when we start to answer that question do we ever have a hope of, of truly stopping sexual trafficking. How do we stop guys from saying and thinking, it's okay for me to go out and buy these girls? So part of the way that we stop demand is you change the culture, sort of this idea of boys will be boys. And when you think of your average buyer, uh, you know, I think people sometimes think that they're pedophiles or they're people that are specifically after girls. But I think what we see more than anything is that these are men who want young women. Uh, and they don't know whether they're 15 or 21, but they want these young women. And it becomes very easy for them. And these uh, are guys that anything from sort of middle class and above, but also sometimes we see in these Latino, in these Latino cantinas, you know, uh, the, the the average salary is not very high with some of these people. So I think it's a broad spectrum of these men that are buying these girls. But the, the common denominator for these men is that they, f they feel like it's very easy for them to buy a girl and have quick sex, basically. And so we're seeing this time and time again that uh, it, it, if we're gonna end demand, it's all about making it scarier, making it harder, and sort of eliminate a, a culture where it's okay to do this. You know, it's always a gamble. Uh, is, is it worth a gamble to, to go online and buy this girl when you might be arrested? Most men would say it's not worth a gamble. But when you live in a city where if you gamble, you always win, and when you gamble, you all, you know, you're never going to be arrested, uh, a place like Houston, you're going to go gamble more often. You're going to buy sex more often if you feel like there are no repercussions to you buying young women. Unfortunately, some people just, to them, ignorance is bliss and they don't want to know because it's tough stuff to know. It doesn't leave you. And so, you know, they would rather just go on about their merry day. And and sadly, that's that's very prevalent in in, you know, just in general. People don't you don't want to know the reality of, of what's going on, you know, behind closed doors and in their communities and, and across the nation and all over the world. It's, it's a hard thing to talk about. The problem with sex trafficking, the problem with sex, the problem with child sexual abuse for boys and girls is that it's all taboo. Can't talk about it. You're not supposed, you're not supposed to talk about those dirty topics. One in five girls are assaulted. Boys are assaulted too. And especially with the way society treats men, men can't even express themselves. They just hold their stuff in. And sometimes in crazy cases, the victims become the victimizers. And you'll hear that story. And so we have to think bigger. We have to raise our voice to say it's not okay. Enough is enough. It is easy to heal the wound of uh, somebody gives you by sword and knife. But this wound, sex trafficking wound, is like a cancer. It is like a termite. This termite eating them. 
eating them 24 hours, moment to moment. At the Center of Hope, there were 43 girls. And I just heard from the director yesterday, now there's 50. The numbers shouldn't be increasing, they should be decreasing. Uh, I think that social media and technology has, is really sort of the driver in terms of this explosive growth that we're seeing. A lot of things that are trending with the new technology are webcams, cyber sex, cyber sex trafficking. Guys are making money, girls are making money uh, from putting children in front of a webcam and there's these perverted people around the world that are like, yep, I want to watch a little Asian kid. <sighs> there's no profile of white, black, Latino, or Asian who's buying this because it's happening uh, all across the board. And sometimes it's, you know, guys that you would think, you know, they should really be spending this money on their family, but they're taking this money and they're spending it uh, on a woman. Uh, I think there are lots of examples of guys that sort of have become addicted to this, that this is something they do a lot. And you, and you see this through some of the uh, review sites where it's the same guys that are doing this, it's sort of become a hobby or something with them. But you see plenty of other guys that do it, you know, once or twice a year. You see guys who do it on vacation. But I think when we're talking about some of these Texas cities though, it's, it's not happening because people are doing vacations or business trips. It's happening because it's easy. When it's personalized, when you encounter a survivor's narrative, uh, it's emotionally impactful. But what do we do with that emotional reaction? One of the things that I find that a lot of American students react is they immediately want violence in a way. There's something about the way our culture works that the solution to every problem is some sort of military intervention or some sort of law enforcement crackdown. It's some sort of use of violence. So what I try to show students is that the ways in which these interventions often exacerbate problems of trafficking, and we've got to look at the more structural issues of poverty if we want to actually make a difference. Poverty and trauma and drug addiction create opportunities that are being exploited by traffickers. Uh, you know, some, some women are snatched on the street I don't want to discount that narrative, but it is not what happens to 99% of women who end up being trafficked. I see a lot of panhandling as a form of human trafficking, and we see that all over the world. Those who are weakest, and women included, become targets for traffickers. There's a line in um, Fight Club, um, Edward Norton goes loose on, on a, on a, a blonde-haired, short-haired kid in a film, and, the protagonist, Brad Pitt, you know, his older ego says, why did you do that? He says, I just want to destroy something beautiful. And unfortunately, there's a group of people in our society that take great joy in destroying something beautiful. And there's nothing more beautiful than a smile of a little boy or a little girl. Me llamo Mario Hidalgo Garfias. Mi edad, 37 años de edad. Estuve 12 años recluido. Estuve por el delito de trata de personas. Me crié entre la basura. No es un justificante. Antes de ser victimario, fue víctima. Sí sufrí abuso sexual. Y lo intentaban todos los días, todos los días, todos los días. Empecé a, a llevar mis chicas de otros lugares. Llegué a ir a Hidalgo por ellas, me las llegué a aventar al hombro y echarme a correr así con la, una chica en, en mis... Ahora sí que en el hombro. Este... Empecé a secuestrar. Tuve más de cinco mujeres al mismo tiempo. Empecé a involucrar a mis hermanos. Y su trabajo era recoger a las chicas y llevarlas a trabajar. 
recogerlas de mi casa, llevarlas a trabajar, recogerlas del trabajo y llevarlas a mi casa. Las chicas me tenían miedo. Yo no sentía tristeza, si lloraban, no me importaba. Para mí era dinero. Yo le podría decir de dónde viene la raíz de todo eso. Y en mi caso fue la educación que yo recibí. La familia, la mala familia de, de la que yo vengo. Me arrepiento de todo el daño que causé. Hice mucho daño. No me gustaría especificarle, pero si algo me arrepiento de verdad y es porque todo el daño que le puede hacer una persona queda grabado para toda su vida. De eso me arrepiento, de haber lastimado a alguien. I was young when it happened, old when he left. He came when it rained. He said, lie still, hold still. I'll do it, don't struggle, no one will know. But they can all tell, they see it, they know it. I'm defiled, soiled, smeared like excrement on a sacred altar. He came telling me it would make me a man. He came telling me it wouldn't last long. He came telling me it wouldn't hurt. Then why does it still ache? Why does it never stop? I lie awake pretending to sleep, hating the nights, dreading the dreams. Puddles in the corner of my soul, fearing the rain, longing for sunshine. I'm kind of embarrassed to say that up until being 27, I had never heard of human trafficking before. The first glimpse I got was uh, my family still has a lot of family at home in Vietnam. In Vietnam, like your neighbor could be your cousin. So I've got like the cousins, right? On Facebook, I would see like the cousins, you know, like I would send pictures. They would, I would send them clothing. They would send me pictures of themselves styling up the clothing. It was really cool and everything. And then one particular uh, cousin of mine, she was actually a neighbor to my mom when she was, my mom was younger in Vietnam. She was started styling the clothing very promiscuously. And so I picked up on it. And the next time I traveled to Vietnam, I started to hang out with her a little bit more. So I said, you know, where do you hang out? You know, show me, you know, where you'd go. And she'd take me to these coffee shops where like right off the bat, what I noticed was a lot of really sexy dressed young women and a lot of American guys. found out that she was working there. She was tending to the men there. And um, later, when I asked her why she worked there, she said that it was a deal made by her uncle and that she couldn't get out of it. She was so afraid to tell me all of this um, because of what her uncle could do. So I looked into it and I realized that this is the thing that's called sex trafficking and that there's so many different angles to it. Like, that's just one story. I met girls that uh, were, let's see, from nine to, to 13, who had had sexual encounters with, on average, about 20 to 25 men a night. Um, I also met uh, women who, <laughs> who had been raped and then would get pregnant from their you know, men, the clients of the brothels, and then they would have to abort the child, but because it's a sin to abort a child in Thailand and also with their faith, they would then have to take the fetus and lay it outside of the, the doorway of the brothel just to kind of ask for forgiveness for sin. I met young girls in, um, Uh, shelters in Vietnam who had scars all up and down their arms um, just to mark who they belong to um, and just watching them sit and sip their shirts and you know just feel so inadequate with their own skin that they're in was like 
It's just disgusting. A lot of people have been assaulted, molested, or raped in this world. And a lot of people are getting raped every single day. They're getting raped 30 to 40 times a day, and someone's just counting some $100 bills and just smiling and gambling and drinking and doing drugs. But you know what it's like to be raped? What's rape? Rape is, holy mo I can't even define rape. Rape is just wrong. Rape is you kill a person inside. You make them dead. And can you imagine when you're being trafficked, you're dying 30 to 40 times a day. You just, your soul is being totally ripped apart. Your sense of aliveness, your sense of identity, your sense of, you know, just your own inner power is ripped away from you. Imagine that. And it's going on all the time. Every 30 seconds, someone's being trafficked right now. Someone's being raped right now. Someone does not have a voice. I think the saddest part is also like some of these kids are so desensitized with knowing that like there's the women that are aware of being ashamed. Okay, that's one thing. But then there's kids who actually don't know that they're working for mafia type, you know, guys in Thailand or in their circumference and that they just think they're doing right for their family. So they're walking around with menus of women on what you can do with them, what these women, how these women can service you, how these little boys can lay with you and they'll just run after you in the streets of these countries have, trying to sell because this is their job and they feel like they're doing good because of whoever they're answering to. Um, I would see grown men uh, jump right into cabs with little boys, um, you know, sitting on their lap. I've seen men play with little boys. It's like, it takes everything to not go and just want to claw these people's faces out, but that's not the answer, you know? Like, going in on one disgusting person is not going to, to save the bigger issue. So, um, those are some of the images in my mind that, that will never leave until I can do everything I can to put a stop to human trafficking. My family's life on the outside was very together, very prominent, very good, highly educated, very influential people. I, I'd never thought that my childhood was abnormal until I was 45, and it struck me that it wasn't. I, I was never meant to start having sex at four, but, but I had sex at four. You know, I, I was beaten for or punished if I... or I was rewarded. Um, with being allowed to participate in an activity or taken to a party where, uh, you know, I was, I was used for sexual gratification. You know, it does something to you. You know, I, I don't know, I don't know why they did it. I think she got aroused watching him beat me and uh, he got aroused, you know, watching her engage me sexually, so. As we're talking right now, somebody's being trafficked, somebody's being sold, somebody is crying because they're not gonna return to their family, someone thinks that they're not gonna make it past another year. Um, it's, it, it's happening right now. And it's insane that it happens in your own backyard. Trafficking happens everywhere. In fact, most people don't know that the number one most popular event where trafficking is happening is the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl is an event we all look towards to celebrate and, and, and be, you know, f have a fun time with your friends and be crazy. And at that exact moment, there are thousands of trafficked women coming into service men. And it, that's something that happens right under our very own eyes. I've been at the Super Bowl celebrating. So just to be aware that, that it's everywhere. Girls are for procreation and um, boys are for pleasure. You hear something like that and you're like, no, nah, that's not really. And then you hear about it more and more and more. Some of the guys I know that served in the military, um, they knew that it was part of every Friday night in Afghanistan. Um, young boys would be taken and forced into sexual acts. 
all the guys get drunk and everything else. And uh, you see them walking around, getting the kids out of uh, elementary school, bring them back home, get everybody drunk, and lo and behold, they have a great time. It wasn't just that they were used, the sex trafficking thing, it was that the sex was used as a tool to brutalize them and totally break them down and deprave them. A personal side for me to do this film and to raise my voice is because I was abused when I was six years old. A painter grabbed me and took me to the bathroom. And I remember lying there on the floor, just looking at the bottom of the toilet, just feeling totally empty and dead inside. And right after, he, he looked me in the eye, he grabbed my arm and he said, if you tell anybody, I will kill you and I will kill your family. And I never said a word. So I just, I just kept silent. But that silence is stopping now. The power, of the, people. the power of the people. When you see a lot of violence in this world, you're moved by it. And I believe if you have a heart, you wanna do something about it. You can't live your life living in violence. You don't want your children to live in any kind of violence. So you wanna do something about it. There are activists on the line, you know, putting their life on the line to save these girls, to save these boys, and we don't hear their stories. And so I think as a movement, we get inspired by other people's stories. So this way we have some kind of idea of, you know, what's going on. We wanted to hear the ups, the downs, what keeps them going? What are the challenges? What's, you know, you know, everybody tries to be perfect in this world and they try to act as if they have it together, but they don't, you know? And to know the struggle, to know their why, to know why they didn't quit, to know that this is what a survivor had to do or believe in in order to escape, or through a social movement, we can bring about change. And if we focus on the movement behind sex trafficking, behind human trafficking, then I believe as a world, we can end this. It always feels difficult when you're in the midst of a fight, you know, it's, it's always, it's hard when you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, where you just gotta keep moving forward and be positive, and I think we can do it. It is a very old issue. 2,600 years ago, there was an extraordinary person on this earth in India. His name was Tirthankar Mahavir. He saw this torturing, this pain, or this suffering. So he found a person, her name was Chandana. And together they raised this issue in the society. I think he saved almost over 30,000 sex slave ladies. And not only that, he saved it. He also initiated them to be on the spiritual path. That's what he was teaching the spiritual path through nonviolence. Real nonviolence is if you save them, 
not only give them shelter, you raise their status high. I think when we think about specific things that we can do, you know, within our community to stop, uh, I think the idea of talking about this and letting people know that it's not uh, just an international issue, that it's a domestic issue as well. I think that's important in terms of growing this awareness uh, and letting people know where trafficking is happening and putting pressure on public officials to change laws. There are plenty of examples of good laws, so you could find laws and you could bring them to your public officials and say, this needs to, needs to stop. I don't know if we have any laws that actually protect women from human trafficking. I know that we have plenty of laws that punish women for human trafficking. What I am beginning to see happen is legislation that is being passed that protects minors from trafficking. They very often become exempt from crimes they might have committed. Uh, you know, in the act of being trafficked. To what extent, however, those laws are enforced is a different question. I think also in changing the culture of, I, I think we've all known young women who think, well, guys who go to strip clubs, it's just what guys do. But I think guys and young women alike need to be saying, it's not what real guys do, it's not what good guys do, uh, because this is part of the problem. This is all part of the web. And when we let do one of these things, we're contributing to this web of human trafficking. As long as we see women as commodities that can be bought and sold, we will pay a price for sex. If we begin to see sex as something that that we cherish, you know, and that we that that only happens consensually, then the demand would hopefully decrease. Stop watching pornography, because pornography very directly fuels human trafficking. And our generation especially is porn addicted. We watch it so much and it directly fuels human trafficking. These girls, these men in pornography, lots of them have been sexually exploited. And it's a supply and demand thing. So as we continue to demand more pornography, they're gonna have to supply more. And that involves sexually exploiting more people. We need to begin to also start uh, punishing those that seek prostitution. You know, we need to punish or criminalize the fact that uh, men buy sex, and we need to criminalize the fact that women, that men hire women out for sex. We need to empower girls to feel strong about themselves. Um, and I think, you know, whether it's sexual assault, whether it's trafficking, whether it's standing up for yourself as an artist or as a creator or just as a girl, you know, um, we need to raise strong girls who believe in themselves and see their worth within themselves and not being given, given to them by others. If you really want to get active, I think uh, doing the equivalent of these tours where you, where you know where trafficking is happening in your town. Oh my gosh, I would say go out and serve. That's the best experience. When I traveled with Nightlight and I actually volunteered, I actually just stripped down and just was a fly on the wall and a source of love for these women, just going there, holding their hands, listening to their stories. What I love is that out of 7 billion people, so many people relate differently to one another, but it takes you stepping out in order to connect with that person. Once you've felt the situation and you understand that there is a need for your help, Look at your circumference. Like, what is your area of influence? Are you a blogger? Are you a teacher? Are you a musician? Are you an aspiring doctor? Whatever your area of influence is, is the perfect voice to help human trafficking. The people who are taking it, they are brave people. But they are not finding the direction. Our go government is so slow on this issue especially the UN. UN is the biggest organization in this world. It's not working enough. Enough's enough. This quote unquote taboo subject that's out there, how do we turn around and make it where it's brought out into the light and um, how do we make our leaders, the decision makers, turn around and put people like myself, people, other agencies, 
use some of those resources to turn around and go after um, go after some of these folks. But I think if there's this, this sense of outcry that this stuff just isn't acceptable, then it can be that Gandhi march, it can be that Martin Luther King Jr., it can be that soft walk in love of protest as opposed to the Malcolm X extremists. But I think we're at a really opportune moment in history to make a difference around these issues because as your film, I'm sure, will show, people all over the world are becoming aware of the problem and want to make a change, want to make a difference. That strength in the end can move mountains. I can tell you that the true life is when we discover our purpose in life and we open our arms, we open our hands, and we really want to give our life to others. We all just said, oh, I'm, you know, what am I going to do? Uh, nothing would ever happen. Nothing would ever get done. There were plenty of people who were affected by something, touched by something, and said, you know what, I'm going to talk about it. And because of that, change happens. Strength in numbers. Like, if you organize human beings and you, you have one cause, you know, you can influence the world, influence society. But if you got 20 guys running around on their own doing something as opposed to getting together and organizing, that's, that's a big difference.